Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the documentary The Bunker Boom with award-winning film director and cinematographer Ariana Le Pen. Should we all be prepping for an apocalyptic event? And what can we learn from these communities? Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, how are you? Hi. How's everything going? Sorry for the delay. That is my fault. No, no, no. all good. All good. And I'm glad that you uh, that you were able to join. Where, where are you right now? That looks absolutely beautiful. I'm in L.A. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful background. Um, so just while everyone's joining, I'm just going to do a little background about you. Um, we have the pleasure of speaking with Ariana Le Pen today, uh, nationally uh, recognized film director and Emmy-nominated cinematographer. Uh, most recently, she directed two excellent films for CNN, The Bunker Boom, which we're going to be talking about today, about a subterranean prepper community in South Dakota, as well as super reviewers about a surprising subculture on the Internet. Uh, prior to this, Ariana directed Emmy-nominated Netflix documentary Connected, uh, the Emmy-nominated Netflix documentary Pandemic, uh, and the Edward Monroe uh, award-winning documentary Unadopted on PBS. Uh, Ariana has directed award-winning work for the New York Times, National Geographic, Al Jazeera, and Viceland on issues ranging from child marriage to gang violence to political conflicts around the world. Uh, her work has taken her to more than 50 countries, uh, directing crews in the sewers beneath London to lock down clean rooms at the NASA Space Center. So really, really excellent work. Uh, she's even embedded with female Kurdish soldiers fighting ISIS in Syria and Iraq and documented the effects of rhino breeding in South Africa for National Geographic. Uh, so like I said, today we're gonna to talk about uh, her latest documentary, The Bunker Boom, which was absolutely amazing, uh, as well as her career, which has, been, which has been quite phenomenal. So again, thank you so much, Ariana, for joining us. It's a real pleasure. Yes, hi, you're welcome. Um, thanks for having me. Um, and I just wanna clarify quickly, the Unconnected the, and Pandemic, there's three episodes, three directors in each in the series. So I did the first two episodes, just I want to give credit to those other directors too. Absolutely. Do all six at the same time. <laughs> um. <laughs> Start by nice of you to have me. Into, into filmmaking, into documentaries. Um, so I was actually initially interested in photojournalism and photography and I, decided to apply to film school thinking that photography would eventually lend itself to filmmaking. And I, I'm not even sure how that decision came about exactly. I mean, we all make a lot of strange decisions when we're 17 or 18 years old, but it, it did actually turn out to be the case that there's a lot of photographers who have turned to filmmaking and that kind of became almost like a movement um, in the early 2000s and 2000s to 2010s. So, so I sort of fell into that same trend and I got into documentary filmmaking because I initially worked on uh, fiction and narrative filmmaking sets and it's a very different world and it works in a very different way than documentary. It's big crews, big, I mean, when you think of a movie, you think of, you know, there's hundreds of people working on it at the same time. And um, that style of filmmaking is very, uh, predetermined and it really has to be planned out and documentary is spontaneous and interacting with real people as opposed to actors is a completely different um, it's a completely different type of work and a completely different type of film that you're trying to make so I got really pulled into the spontaneity and the serendipity of following real life and stranger than fiction stories and that's how I ended up here well you, you know you know speaking about stranger than fiction or stranger than life stories what, what stories really grab you obviously there's so many potential documentaries but what gets you involved and really makes makes you want to do a certain documentary um i think for me that's something and it's something i've learned over the years is there, there's a difference between a, a film or a project about a topic versus um, a real story so there has to be a character that's going through some kind of journey and that becomes the story. The story, story becomes about that um, as opposed to I'm going to make a film about this issue or topic. So I want to find a person that can be the, the, the character that you go on the journey with or something, some kind of angle into the, 
to the topic that's like a story that's developing in some way um, that makes it more compelling than just here's something that's interesting to learn about. Because we can read an article about something interesting, which also needs to have a story. I should, I, I don't mean to, um, yeah, but with a film you're putting, you know, or you're putting a, a lot of time into watching it. So you have to give the audience a story to follow. Now, you know, all of your documentaries really require a lot of authenticity, which means immersing yourself in that environment. How do you and your crew truly immerse yourselves uh, in these sometimes, you know, outlandish environments to really get an authentic documentary? That is a tough question, but I, it's almost like you need to be a really good listener. So in the same way that being a good listener is good for friendship or a relationship with a partner or therapy, <laughs> you know, being a good listener is kind of the key to any human relationship. And you are forming a relationship with the people that you're filming and they're inviting you into your, their life, which is a very, you know, a hard thing to do and can be um, tense or stressful in some ways. And so you have to be a really good listener and, and just uh, instead of, so I, my style is not so much to push my agenda, but to sort of wait, see what happens, listen, um, work with a person and take them in, you know, if I want to find something out, like ask them to join me in um, talking about something and give them time and space to get there. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really hard thing to do. And it mo first thing that anyone would say is like, the more time you have, the better chance you are uh, ha going to have of making a connection with somebody and making a connection is how you make a good film. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you would probably have to spend a, a decent amount of time in the environment that you want to film before you start filming. Yeah, you, I mean, that's the ideal scenario. And, and you know, so pe you'll hear people talk about um, the problems with, um, you know, parachuting in, so to speak, somewhere. And, and that just means, like, if, if there's not enough time, which sometimes that's the way the news cycle works. Like, you know, something happens, news occurs, you have to send someone in to report on it. That's a very different thing than filmmaking. So with a film, you understand that, you're going to spend more time and that's the idea is to get a, a deeper look into someone's lives that the story is about so instead of covering the news event you're you are relating a story of how that affects someone let's say so yes you would want to spend more time and the more time you have the better the film is probably going to be absolutely uh, but let's everything transition. has a timeline <laughs> so yeah exactly has it has a timeline and so it can go on forever yeah, and I'm sure you have time demands yourself. So it's like, how early can you really get there before you start filming? And obviously, yeah, really a lot of demands. To out. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your latest documentary, which was awesome, talking about the bunker boom. Maybe just give us like a 30 second to one minute synopsis for people who may not have seen it. What is the general premise of the bunker boom? So the bunker boom is about um, the American practice of Move, moving into bunkers, which is not completely new. Um, it has, people have been doing this over time for some time, but there's a bit of, there's been a bit of an explosion in recent years of people um, seeking bunker living and, and going off grid. Everyone's heard of going off grid. And that I, I think is a, a very particularly American thing to do. And so the film investigates a particular community in South Dakota where people have agreed to essentially live in a communal environment in this area and all live in bunkers and kind of work together as a community. And the reason that was interesting to me is um, you don't usually think of people moving into a bunker to be in a community with other people they go usually if you're going into a bunker it's to isolate and to be by yourself and so it's a very unusual scenario to have uh you know dozens of bunkers of people living in a community together so i wanted to find out what was going on there it's it's such an interesting concept tell us so you mentioned that it's a community how big is this community how did it or when did it start and how big do you think it's going to become um so it started just a few years ago in the last couple of years. So um, 
they they opened in the last couple years and some people a few people moved in right away and then since then it's been sort of you know people coming in here or there a lot of people so there's a there's some people who buy a bunker and don't intend to live in it full time and then there's a, a growing group that is living there full time and so i was interested in the people that are living there full time and the you know for the people that are buying it they're buying it as a backup essentially you know and who are not living there um in terms of how big it'll grow. So right now, you know, there's, there's like dozens of families and I'm not, or I'm not there right now. So I can't say for sure. But um, when I was filming, um, there was, you know, about a, a dozen families um, and it, and they were saying to me that there are new people coming and buying it all the time. There was supposed to be a new family coming in from new Orleans with um, that the, the wife was pregnant. And so that was going to be the first baby. So there were already, um, a couple of families that were living there with kids. Um, and this was going to be the first family where a, a baby would be born there. So it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, to see how that goes and what it's like um, for the kids that are living there and how big it will grow that I can't say, cause I can't predict the future, but um, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, kind it's of mind boggling to experiment to follow. Yeah, I mean, like to live in these bunkers and I think people, assume a bunker is like an eight by 10 jail cell, but I've, I've obviously seen the documentary and it's not. Just explain explain what these bunkers entail. What are they? Yeah, they're, they're actually quite big. Um, so the site was originally a US military depot, essentially where they were. So each of those bunkers, they were built to store ammunitions um, for, by the military. And it, it, then it became retired at a certain point. The military stopped using it for that purpose. And so it was just sort of sitting fallow. Um, so they're actually these like very large structures. Um, you know, think of like a house, but all laid out on one floor. So, but it's one large silo. So you have to, like a long house. So you'd have to, they have to divide it up and build it out inside and build it into different rooms. Um, and so they're large, but they are cold. <laughs> and so you have to figure out, it's a real, what's interesting about the project is people figuring out how to build this out to their own specifications. And it's a, a real, again, sort of experiment and a life lesson and like what you're made of. And I think a lot of the people that go there are doing it for that reason to see like how much they can accomplish on their own, or that's part of their reasons. I think some for, for some of the people there is to, you know, and then some, you know, other people hire people to build it out for them. So not everyone does, you know, the do it, the DIY approach, but some people definitely are. Now these bunkers, these are, these are impervious to nuclear blasts, any natural disaster, is that, well, is that the idea? They haven't been tested, so we can't say for sure. They, when they were built, they're very, they're like several feet thick of concrete and steel. And so they're, they were designed to withstand blasts. Um, they were designed to withstand that kind of thing. But, I, you know, the United States didn't uh, take in any kind of bombing in that area. So we'll never know for sure. But certainly they could withstand quite a lot. If you if you were to see them in person, if you could see the thickness of them, I mean, you could. Nothing's getting in is certainly the case. Is the general premise? That's the general I mean, premise. I mean, I I guess the next question that I think everyone has is, what are these people preparing for? Right, like, what's their biggest fear? What are they worried about? Um, that so, I think, and this is a, a reason to watch the film is. Um, people had surprisingly different reasons you kind of have an idea of what preppers are like and and i think most people so firstly some people identified as preppers and then you know like one of the individuals in the film who i talked to he said i wouldn't even call myself a prepper i certainly wouldn't have before this maybe now i would um so there was a real variety of reasons i mean i think some people yeah, so it ran the gamut from all the things you could think of. There was, I think the fact that COVID hit in this time period of the past two years was definitely an impetus for some to do make the move right then. So it was maybe, you know, like the older couple that I talked to in the film, they had been thinking about buying a house um, in, I, I forget, somewhere in the South because they were from Georgia. And um, 
they were going to build out like a bunker underneath the house. But then they came across this place and decided this is already ready to go essentially. Like, why don't we, why don't we do this instead? And it was during COVID. So um, the wife had some, has some pre existing health problems. And so she was actually very worried where they were living. People weren't vaccinated. And so this actually seemed like a good um, place for them to go where they could kind of isolate. Um, but then other people, you know, sort of the opposite reason, you know, like one family I talked to, he was very frustrated with, like, basically, essentially, like government regulations on his business. And so he sort of made a split second, he sort of made a decision to come and, and do live this lifestyle instead, because, because of the shutdowns that were happening, he felt like he wasn't able to continue his business and continue to make money. So, so it was, it's interesting that like two ends of the spectrum in that sense. And then there were other reasons too. I mean, it wasn't all one thing. I met a couple that was very religious and that, that, that was the reason that they were coming because, you know, as you know, like Mormons, for instance, are preppers and they were Mormons, but that was one couple. So like everyone was a different story. Um, and a surprise, a surprise, they had their own particular reasons. Um, and then, you know, there were like political reasons. Um, so it really, it was surprising. And I, I would encourage people to watch the film on CNN to, to find out more. It was surprisingly, it was less fringe than I expected. You know, you go, when you research a film, you own, all you have is what people have already f found out, you know, on the internet or other publications and whatnot but I found that it, it's not a story that people have dug very deeply into mostly when we think of preppers we think of like the National Geographic reality show doomsday preppers and obviously that's a reality show so they're going for kind of the craziest wildest stories and the, the craziest reasons people are doing it but I found that it was like a, a bit more mainstream than I expected or there yeah, are, I mean so that's what I wanted to ask people you people who have this interest than I expected. Yeah, I mean, because that's that was my next question was that I think the general perception of doomsday preppers is there's some crazy apocalyptic, you know, conspiracy theory believing people. That's the general consensus that I think many people have that perception. But having spent time there, is that perception accurate? It's not that those people don't exist. There, there's, there's. It's just that it's a wider spectrum than you might think. So. I think what I deter what I discovered is that so I di I didn't want to do a story about um, people that were so extreme like on doomsday preppers that you can't even it's hard to relate to their reasoning right so I wanted to find people that you could kind of you could understand why they you that they were making the decisions they're making it might not be the same decision you make but you understand what they're what and relate to what they're saying and so what. I think that, you know, what I discovered is that, you know, America's, the country is in a bit of a state of turmoil, I guess you could say, politically, and I, I'm not even saying why, but I think we can all agree that it's been a tumultuous few years. And so people, I think, um, feel a little bit of a sense of uncertainty. And when there is uncertainty, whether it's uncertainty in the markets or, you know, uncertainty in the economy, politics, uh, that leads people to be fearful and fear can lead to a feeling of needing to isolate and protect yourself from other people. Um, and that's a very common human experience. It's yeah. more common these... than you would, you know, imagine. And it's not now, just about bunkers. Now these people, just like you said, they are literally leaving society and they're going off the grid right? That's, that's such a major move. What does, what does that approach, what problems does that approach incur when you go off the grid? Um, well, it, it's like, sort of, so the problem that occurs is it's sort of built into the premise, which is like, so society is a way, is a th society is a thing that people build to help them work together right? Like we are part of societies because we can't do things by ourselves. You can't do everything by yourself. And so we have a, an economy that we're all a part of and we have a political government that, you know, runs things and all of those things that we sort of take for granted that are what society is. Well, those things play more of a role than you realize. And you don't realize that until you 
go off grid and don't have that infrastructure. And so when you're really trying to do everything by yourself, um, even in a small, and when I say that, even in a small community, when you're trying to do something in a small community, it's hard. There's a lot of basic things like water. You know, when you live in a city, the, your water system, how you get your water, it's all taken care of. You don't think about the most mundane everyday things, heating, everything like that. That Those mundane things are part of being part of a society. And um, I think that people, when people go off grid, it is, there is an awakening, like a, a little bit of a rude awakening of, oh, you don't think of all of having to, to set all of that up and what that's going to entail. And it makes you reminisce and nostalgic a bit for society. And so I think some of the people, which was amazing and great about the film is were very honest with me about like the things they miss from being part of like the larger society as opposed to starting your own small society. Like they had high hopes for starting their own small society, but they were running into the, some of the same problems you'd expect to run into if you're trying to start your own society. No, of but course. I, there's also another part of the film, which is I talked to, um, people on the other end of the spectrum who, you know, Silicon Valley, um, former Silicon Valley entrepreneur, still actually, and he's sort of on the super, you know, the wealthier end of the spectrum. And there's, uh, there's also a movement in Silicon Valley of kind of buying bunkers. So I, I forgot to mention that that's kind of the, the parallel that's running through the film is there's this small community in South Dakota, which is more middle-class people. And then there's, you know, there's also this other kind of parallel movement happening in Silicon Valley where the ultra rich are, are getting into the same pr pr process of, of sort of isolating. And, and, and I was exploring why are they doing that as well? And again, to kind of talk about it is a universal, is a universal instinct to isolate and where that comes from. Now, one of the more interesting things is that these these preppers are not really alone. That the that the survivalist real estate market is actually booming. Is that something that you found that these bunkers are getting bought up? That they're building more? That this is something that's actually gaining momentum? I think it's yeah. I'd say it is gaining. I'm moving a little bit away from. I don't know. Are you hearing the sawing in the back? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, outside. Let's all good. Um, it is. Is gaining it's gained momentum, and I think it's like many um, forces in a society or economy. Things kind of there's like a, a bell curve, you know, it waxes and wanes. And I think right in the last few years, there's been a waxing period of more people. There are more people starting kind of bunker type, either communities that like I. This is not the only one that I found. So I also looked at this place called Survival Condo. That's like a multi-story borough deep underground survival condo, essentially, where people buy units in the in this condo building underground, and that's also sort of the first of its kind in that sense. Um, I think that's for sort of super rich. So what I found is that um, it's not like bunkers are taking over the country. It's not that kind of boom. It's it's a it's a boom relative to that not being a thing until fairly recently that there's enough interest in this to sell out a condo building underground. I mean that's Crazy. surprising. That's and then there's those are very expensive. So those are like a million dollars or more. Something like that. So again, like an interest that's growing on different, you know, throughout the spectrum of wealth in this country. I mean, I would say that, you know, uh, what does this extreme yet growing microcosm say about our society that there's this impetus to shelter and have bunkers and be off the grid? I mean, very concerning, at least from my perspective. I mean, you've been there. But what does that say about our society at large that more and more people are basically huddling for protection and shelter? Yeah, I think it's concern i i understand yeah i see the concern there and that was something that uh, it interested me and in my opinion we it's productive to try to be a part of your society and to change it in the way that you want to um rather than to isolate but that's just a personal opinion and that's i didn't go into making the film trying to communicate that I wanted to go into the film and understand what was the reasoning behind it. I, I don't know that it means something uh, enormous in terms of, you know, what does it all mean kind of thing. I think, like I was saying before, I think that 
people in a society go through periods and like you could look back in time and you know look at isolationist periods in our american history you know before world war 1 or something like that there are there've been times in our history where we've sort of as a country gone through isolationist policies and meaning like we're going to focus on the united states and not interact with you know geopolitical situations around the world so as a society it's something we do and i think as a people it's something people have a tendency to do there are obviously reasons that they're doing that and i think um you know it remains to be seen what that actually means or if it's something that will blow over i mean i think this is why science fiction is really interesting it explores themes like this like what does it mean um if people make decisions like that as a group you know you'll you'll see the science fiction story where people go and settle on another planet or something like that and it, it sort of explores these types of themes and it's it's a good thing I think to think about as, yeah. as an exercise and to understand why people do and make decisions like that. Now just talking about your career um in general, you've done some amazing work, some amazing pieces. In your opinion, what was the most memorable? Oh, uh, I think being in Syria was the most memorable. Um just cuz it was like a a difficult entry and exit into the country. the very memorable uh, entry um and just you know i i think some sometimes people will ask well, why would you want to do something like that and for me i i think what's so compelling about working in this field is you get to you know to go somewhere in the time and place that something monumental is happening and to be able to spend time with the people who are living through it is is a privilege to it's it's not just about um it's such a rare experience to be able to understand how what people are going through um when they're experiencing something really enormous like that and the people that i met their their stories are, were so interesting and you know there's no way to to have that kind of understanding just by like reading about something or watching something to experience something firsthand is a very unique experience and it gives you a different understanding of the world and the things that are you know the the events that you hear about it gives you a very different understanding of them so you know for me uh, to meet like these young women who are training to be soldiers and um fighting against ISIS uh, i mean these are all young women who had no prior military experience they were faced with an impossible situation where there's uh, you know essentially an enemy force because ISIS is very anti-kurdish and these soldiers were kurdish women um and the reasons for that is like a difference of religious principles essentially i mean and also ISIS i mean there's a k- uh, killing force sort of you know eliminating people who don't agree with their religious ideas um And so, you know, I mean it's a crazy thing to try to imagine like what if you were a young a, a you know, a young person, a teenager seeing this happening around you and deciding to join the military or the military that exists, right. the mil- militia force that's trying to protect. It's to be able to talk to people and kind of and then of course there's young men doing the same thing. So meeting all of these people and it's just like this impossible situation that they're in and very difficult circumstances, you know, like wearing sneakers and shooting using old weaponry and um yeah it's very much oh, totally was that also your most challenging documentary that was the most challenging yes because the night that we entered the country over the border um there's the bombing there so the turkish military bombed the kurdish base um and so the the conflict over there is like way more complicated than is a is like easily reported or or easily understood yeah, like basically there's a whole other political conflict going on between Turkey and the Kurds and so Turkey while the the battle for ISIS against ISIS is going on Turkey was co- concurrently also bombing Kurdish forces because they have their own issue where they Turkey considers the Kurdish political groups a terrorist group of their own. Again, this is like oh it's a lot to explain right now, but of course to just to say that 
that bombing happened the night that um, we were entering the country and I was entering, we were entering on, on foot. And so that wow. was just, to, I mean, you know, to see that and to, you know, the scramble, you know, again, like to, to understand what people go through and is you'll never have another, a, a deeper understanding than to experience it firsthand. And it also gives you like great empathy for um, what people are living with. Yeah, I mean, it really makes you appreciate that beautiful view behind you of LA and yeah, I know, and the it's peaceful like, nature that we live in every day. Yeah, definitely makes yeah. you appreciate that. You know, you've had such an amazing career so far. It's obviously very early. What do we expect next? What's your next move? Any really exciting projects we should look out for? Um, I am. Yeah, I'm working on a documentary. I'm trying to pitch a documentary series that I came up with recently. And I'm also working on a very personal project that's a podcast. Um, that's kind of like a raging bull story about an unusual character, um, sort of tragic downfall. Um, so yeah, two projects that uh, I'm working on right now. And I also just directed the new season of Waffles and Mochi, which is a kid's show. Uh, with puppets, which is totally other end of the spectrum from, you know, what we were just talking about in Syria. Um, so a lot going on. Awesome. Well, listen, Ariana, I know you're super busy. Um, thanks for your time. Amazing career. Anyone who hasn't seen The Bunker Boom, watch it. It's a real, it's a real eye opener when you talk about society and these, and these preppers. So again, congrats on all your achievements for all our listeners. Uh, this podcast and all others are going to be streaming live on all the different media outlets and we'll see you next week. Thanks you so much, say, Ariana. Sure. Sorry, Ricardo, let me just say, so the film, it already aired on CNN Live and now it's going to be on CNN Plus, uh, which launches in March. So then if you have that platform, you'll be able to watch it anytime. Uh, and then the trailer is uh, on my website and also on CNN's website. So, and I think you put the link in here. Absolutely. So that's how people can watch it. All right, All right. Well, take care, Ariana. Thank you so much Thank again you. for your time. Have an All awesome right. weekend. Yeah. Take care. You too.